All right, Mary, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so thanks everyone for being here. Um, so today we're really happy to have uh, Syed Jafar here. Syed is a professor of electrical engineering and computer science at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, he has a BTech from IIT Delhi, a master's from Caltech, and a PhD from Stanford, all in electrical engineering. Um, he's also held positions at Lucent Bell Labs and at Qualcomm. Uh, his research includes multi-user information theory, wireless communications, and network coding. Um, he's won many, many, many awards. Uh, I will not mention them all, but they include several best paper awards, the Blavatnik National Award for Young Scientists. He was named to Science Watch's World's Most, Most Influential Scientific Minds uh, five years in a row. Um, and he was named an IEEE Fellow in 2014. Um, he's also been named the EECS Professor of the Year Award uh, at UC Irvine five times. Um, yeah, so we're very happy to have him here to tell us about exploring interference alignment through the lens of private information retrieval. Uh, take it away, Ted. Great, thank you. Um, can you hear me, Mr. Check? <laughs> I'm fine? Okay. All right, so thank you very much, um, Mary, for the introduction, and Daniel and the rest of the program committee for this uh, opportunity to present our work. This is not my usual audience, so I'll keep that in mind in Maybe if you find sometimes I'm explaining things too much and they sound trivial, <laughs> and it's just because I have no idea what common reference to use sometimes. All right, so this is uh, work by my students Hua Sun and Zhu Qingjia on, uh, on the topic of private information retrieval from an information theoretic perspective. Um, and so before I jump into this talk, let me say a little bit about just our perspective, like how, why do we work on these problems and what do we expect um, out of them. So uh, one of the main things that is most interesting to me is the question of how, um, you know, in many situations you have some desired information as well as some undesired information, and that's what we call interference. So how do how those two kinds of uh, information coexist? over the same resources, for example, in the same memory or over the same uh, transmission, over the same bandwidth or whatever the context might be. And interference alignment is an idea that um, helps us see uh, optimal ways of uh, uh, um, creating coding schemes where desired information and undesired information can be optimally packed into the smallest space possible. So that's, that's what we're going for. Uh, in this regard, uh, Maybe uh, as information theorists, we are always interested in ideas that, um, I mean, ideas more than applications. So what I mean is, uh, okay, so I'm interested in privacy. That's one reason to be interested in private information retrieval. But for me, the biggest, the bigger reason to investigate private information retrieval is the so many connections that this problem has to other problems and the ways, the interesting ways that it allows me to think about interference alignment and how to uh, hopefully take the insights from this problem and apply it to other problems as well. So with that uh, bit of context, let me, for some reason my screen is frozen. Okay, this one works. All right, so here's the overview of the talk. I will present just a very minimal um, introduction to what is interference alignment. Um, then, uh, then I will, um, of course, PIR may be very familiar, but I will still just de de um, define it briefly and um, go into why it is interesting to my research group. Uh, then I'll present uh, sort of the main result in this talk is the capacity of PIR, I'll present that. And then we will see how um, that result allows us to say something about other things that are related to PIR. So for example, uh, locally decodable codes, what can we say about those based on the capacity result of PIR? And that, that's pretty much the agenda for the whole talk. All right, so let's start with what is interference alignment. So I'll explain it with a very um, sort of almost trivial kind of toy example. So here we have three linear equations in four unknowns. The unknowns are W1, W2, W3, and W4. And like I mentioned, usually we think of situations where some of the unknowns are desired and some, the rest of them are undesired or interference. So in this case, let's, um, uh, what we are assuming is that W1 is the, un is the desired information, meaning from these equations, I want to solve for W1. 
On the other hand, W2, W3, W4, they're interference because they're just limiting my ability to solve these equations for W1. So they're interfering with my ability to do that. Um, now, in general, of course, you shouldn't expect to be able to solve for four unknowns from three equations. So that presents a problem. And that's why we need something and that, that, that's interference alignment. Um, also, let me point out before I go to the solution that you notice that this uh, set of equations allows me some control in, the term, I mean, in terms of these uh, uh, parameters, alpha and beta, that I'm free to choose. Okay. And why is it that I have some control over these equations? Because uh, the typical problems where I see these equations are problems where um, I have some control because maybe I designed the coding scheme, maybe I designed the, you know, what download I'm requesting from a server. Uh, so, so those are the kind of uh, knobs that I have to control what equations I end up with. So in this toy example, I'm just saying, okay, let's suppose we can control alpha and beta. The rest of them are already fixed. And so we want to choose alpha and beta in such a way that from these three equations, I can solve for W1 as a function of S1, S2, S3. So that's the toy problem. And uh, now, um, how do we think about these problems? So the way we think about it is this way. So let's write these as vectors. Um, so now uh, we see here four vectors. Um, let's call this vector V1, V2, V3, and V4. And so the way we think is, well, um, we have four signals. I'll just call the unknowns signals. So we have four signals, W1, W2, W3, W4, that appear along these four vectors or the four dimensions, okay? But overall, we have only a three-dimensional vector space so because after all, all these vectors are three by one vectors. So in a three-dimensional vector space, I have four vectors carrying four signals or four unknowns. I care about only one of those unknowns, and that's W1. So now let's see what control do we have. We have no control over the interference uh, from W3 because this vector is already fixed. We have no control over this V4 either. So already these two interfering signals occupy two dimensions out of my three-dimensional uh, total signal space. And that's because these two vectors are linearly independent, so they span two dimensions in, in this three-dimensional space. So that means two dimensions are already taken by interference. Um, now, one thing we will see, and this is information theoretically true, it's not just a, like a linear equation or just a signal processing statement, information theoretically true, that the dimensions occupied by the desired signal and the dimensions occupied by interference cannot overlap. So here, because I have already taken two dimensions by interference, W3 and W4 already have occupied two dimensions and I have only three dimensions, so that leaves me just one dimension for desired signal. What that means is that the remaining interference from W2 cannot occupy any extra dimension beyond what's already been taken by interference. So therefore, this vector V2 um, um, has to occupy the same space that's already being occupied by vectors V3 and V4. And what that means is that V2 must lie in the span of um, V3 and V4. So that's easy to do. We will choose beta in such a way that this vector, V2, lies in the span of V3 and V4. So just take this three by three matrix whose columns are V2, V3, V4. For that determinant to be zero, find out what beta that is, and that's beta equal to six. So that guarantees that V2 is in the span of V3 and V4. In fact, now after you plug in beta equal to six, V2 is V3 plus two V4. So you can see that this, this interference from signal two is not going to bother us anymore because it's occupying the same space that V3, V3 and V4 were already occupying. So, that, so now if we rewrite the equations with this, so let's see what happened because of that. What has happened is now we still have three equations, of course, but the number of unknowns has effectively gone down from four to three. So earlier we had W1, W2, W3, W4. Now the unknowns are W1. This aligned variable, W3 plus W2, which I can think of as just one variable, and another aligned variable, W4 plus 2W2. So now I have three equations and three unknowns, and it makes sense that I should be able to solve it, provided the equations are uh, independent. And to, so, so it still remains to guarantee that the desired signal, which is this vector V1, 1, 5 alpha, that vector should not um, you know, align with the interference space, because like I said, the desired signal should always remain separate from the interference space. So that's easy to guarantee. I just have to make sure that alpha does not uh, put V1 into the interference space, and it turns out any value of alpha other than four. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention all symbols are in F7 here, just for this example. Uh, so any value of alpha other than four will work. Um, so that's basically what the idea of interference alignment is in, in a very simple sense. 
so you note that we are able to decode the desired information, W1, once we have chosen alphas and betas correctly. Uh, but notice that we are not able to decode W2 or W3, I mean, or, or W4. Uh, um, yeah, but that doesn't mean we're not able to decode anything else. We can, in fact, decode W3 plus W2. And we can also decode W4 plus 2W2. It's just that we cannot decode you know, W2, W3, W4 individually. So that's the general picture to keep in mind. And this may not be so obvious in how we solve PIR, but this is exactly how we think. So just so you know how we are thinking of the problem when you see the solution, because it may not be obvious how, how what we were um, seeing when we were looking at that problem. So why is it so important uh, in information theory? It is because many problems in network information theory present us with systems of linear equations. Um, and as is often the case, even in PIR, we'll see the same thing. Some of the unknowns are desired, the rest of them are interference. And the goal generally in these problems is to allow or to somehow accomplish a recovery of desired variables um, uh, while using the smallest possible number of equations. Okay, so you want to not take up too many dimensions um, and still be able to recover the desired information. Uh, and of course, depending on what problem we are solving, different problems will allow us different levels of control over these equations. Like in this toy example, I said, okay, maybe you can choose alpha and beta. But depending on the problem, you have different levels of control over these equations, and that's what makes problems different, because each problem has its own set of constraints on what you can do with these equations. So by solving these problems, um, we learn something about fundamental alignment structures. That's generally our motivation in most of the problems that we look at, and that was the, our motivation in PIR as well. So what I'll do here is I'll just briefly go over some very, uh, I mean, very, very short summaries of different settings where we see the same kind of situation. Uh, the first setting here is a wireless interference network. So what you have is many transmitters talking to many receivers. So transmitter one is talking to receiver one, transmitter two wants to talk to receiver two at the same time and so on. So you can have any number of transmitters and receivers. Um, but because it's a wireless setting, everybody can hear everybody else. So every receiver will see a superposition of signals from all transmitters. So that's the system of equations that each receiver is seeing. So notice that each receiver will see a different system of equations depending on the channel coefficients that are associated with that receiver. Um, whereas, um, so another challenge you face in this setting is that the channels themselves if you think of those channel coefficients as these coefficients that appear in the equations, those coefficients are fixed by nature because we don't really design our wireless channel. Channel is just whatever the uh, environment presents us. So um, in some sense, it seems like we have no control over these equations. But if you think about it, what happens is instead of just transmitting their symbols uncoded, what the transmitter does is it applies some kind of linear transformation to the trans symbols that it wants to transmit and then sends that transformed version. And because of that linear transformation, there is some control that the transmitter has over these ultimate equations that the receiver will see. And that's the control that we use then to try to achieve alignment so that every receiver can decode their desired information, uh, while of course they will not be able to decode the undesired uh, equations. So that's one, uh, that was uh, essentially our starting point uh, into these kinds of problems. But there are many such problems. For example, if you take the same wireless network, the interference network, um, but now you say that suppose the transmitters don't even know the channel coefficients. So channel coefficient values, so these like, you know, these numbers one, five, 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 six, and so on. These numbers are not known to the transmitters. The receivers, by the way, always know the channels in, in every problem we do in wireless. Uh, but let's say the transmitters don't know. Um, so what, can, what, what is it that they do know which, that they can use? Um, it turned out in this problem topological interference management, the transmitters know the topology of the network, meaning they just know which channel coefficients are zero and which ones are non-zero. Okay? If they're non-zero, then they don't know the value. They just know it's non-zero. So under this assumption, just with this knowledge of what is zero and what is not zero, it turns out it's still possible to align and create nice interference alignment solutions. And that, that is the problem of topological interference management. Another related problem, another one where you have a wireless network where the channels are not known to the transmitters. Uh, in fact, the topology here can be also um, extremely challenging in the sense that everything is connected to everything else. So fully connected topology it still allows opportunities for interference alignment. Um, 
if the channel has some coherence pattern, meaning, um, for example, the channel coefficients change every three channel uses, they take a new independent value, and then another three channel uses, they take another independent value. What these values are may not be known to the transmitter, but the transmitter knows that they change every three channel uses, so that's called a coherence pattern. So, so just the knowledge of these coherence patterns allows the transmitter again to exercise some control in what kind of pre-coding they do on the symbols they transmit such that at each receiver interference would be aligned in, in a good way that allows the receiver to decode what they want and uh, not suffer, not sacrifice too many dimensions to interference. By the way, this blind interference alignment problem is what brought us to PIR. Uh, unfortunately, in this talk, I will not have the time to get, explain the connection between the two, but at least in very simple cases, PIR is essentially blind interference alignment. So that's why we got start, started in the PIR problem. Um, so other problems that we have worked on where, again, we use the interference alignment perspective include distributed storage repair. So here you have different databases. These databases store linear equations because we're using some linear, <coughs> excuse me, linear, linear storage code. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, for example, an MDS code. And the typical problem that we have in distributed storage exact repair is maybe one of the storage nodes um, fails. So then the information that that node was storing is lost. Now another node has to come in, that's the repair node. And from the nodes that are still alive, it wants to download some information from those nodes in order to be able to reconstruct exactly what was lost, meaning what was stored by the node that failed. It wants to do so by downloading as little as possible. So it wants as few equations as possible and still it wants to reconstruct just what was lost. It doesn't care about the rest of it. So that's why, again, it has some desired information, some interference, and it has to find some clever way of downloading equations such that the interference aligns and the desired information is, um, is uh, decodable. So again, that problem falls into the same category. Index coding, another huge problem, of course, index coding covers everything in network coding. Um, that's a setting where you broadcast the same set of equations to all the receivers, if you have linear index coding, for example. But each receiver has different side information about which messages they already know that they're able to subtract from, from the uh, broadcasted symbols. And therefore, because each receiver is able to subtract different symbols, in the end, they end up with different equations. And then uh, the equations need to be design, designed in a clever way again, so that each receiver with the equations that it has is able to decode the desired information, meaning the message that he cares about and not have to suffer too much from the undesired information uh, or the interference. All right, seems like I'm going a little slow here. So, um, um, yeah, so there are many equations, many settings like that. I hope that's clear. Um, and the, the setting we're particularly interested in is the PIR problem or private information retrieval problem. And that'll be the focus of this talk. All right. Um, I think it's pretty simple so far, so I will not stop here. Maybe I'll stop after the next uh, point for in case there are any questions. So what is PIR and why is it interesting? So let me just very briefly explain what PIR is. Eventually we'll get into more details. So the goal of PIR, well, in a PIR setting, you have N databases or servers. Each database, well, this is a very simple setting. You can have, of course, some variations on it. But in the simple setting, each database stores K, well, we have K messages and all K messages are stored um, at every database. Then we have a user and that user wants one of these messages. So he could want any one of those messages. Let's say he wants the message W theta. Um, so in order to retrieve his desired message, the user will send some queries to the databases and then based on the queries, the databases will provide some answers or responses. And from those responses, the user should be able to recover his desired message W theta. The important thing here is that the queries that the user sends to the databases should not reveal anything about theta. So meaning the queries should be independent because this is information theoretic privacy. So they have to be absolutely independent of theta. Um, of course, this problem originated in uh, theoretical computer science and cryptography. It's been around for a while. It was, um, I think, Chor et al. that started the, this, uh, um, I mean, the, did the seminal work on this problem. And, 25 years ago, and this had been explored quite a bit. Um, as far as I can tell, nobody has ever mistaken PIR for a practical problem, a problem that has a practical application. 
So this quote probably says it better than I could, that there's really two kinds of people, those who think that PIR is useless and those who have never heard of PIR. So yeah, I agree. I mean, it's not, it's not the practical applications of it that makes it so interesting um, to us, especially, I mean, speaking from my perspective. So what is it about PIR that makes it interesting? And put simply, it's the connections that PIR has with, with everything else. And that's, uh, as I pointed out in the beginning of the talk, uh, that's really what's most interesting to me. So for example, our own interest in PIR started with connections that we noticed uh, between blind interference alignment schemes that we have previously um, uh, worked on and private information retrieval schemes. So in some simple cases, they're exactly the same scheme. So you can, that's, that's what we thought was curious and got us interested into the problem. Then, as I mentioned, there are other uh, settings in wireless networks where the transmitter does not do the channel coefficients and still has to achieve alignment. So especially those kind of settings are called topological interference management. So there's a connection again there. Now it turns out topological interference management is in a strong sense equivalent to index coding. Um, it's not quite information theoretic equivalence, but it's equivalence in a linear setting. So anything you can do with linear codes in one problem, you can do it with the other problem as well. So these two problems are equivalent. Of course, index coding is equivalent to everything in network coding, but especially the connection between index coding and locally repairable codes um, have, been, uh, have drawn attention. They've been uh, presented at ISITs. Now, locally repairable codes, of course, are close to locally decodable codes. And we know that locally decodable codes, as Yakanin's thesis showed, are um, intimately connected to private information retrieval. So really, there's a whole you know, uh, circle of life kind of thing here that everything is connected to everything else. But this is not everything either. I mean, so if you just explore the different contexts in which private information retrieval has appeared either as an essential ingredient of some other scheme or just as some kind of equivalence, uh, then really there's too many topics you could list where uh, the connections um, appear. Uh, things ranging from oblivious transfer, for instance, hiding secret sharing and secure computation, and uh, um, secure distributed matrix multiplication. This, is, this last topic is something we are currently working on as well. So in the conclusion, I will say something about that. Also in this talk, I'll say something about this connection as well, locally decodable codes in PIR. So anyway, the point here is that what makes PIR so interesting is these connections um, that it has with so many other problems. So there's a chance that anything, any interesting alignment structures um, that we learn by studying PIR will help us solve other problems as well. And that, that is basically essential to network information theory. All right, so now, um, that was all this introduction. So let me get into the capacity of PIR. Um, so, um, so now we have uh, considered the setting where we have n databases, k messages. Each database stores every message, uh, and the messages can have length l bits. By the way, the one big difference in how we think of PIR problem versus how, um, like originally, maybe the PIR problem was. Uh, um, conceived is that we think of messages as being huge because information theory generally assumes that messages are large. Okay? And so, so the length of a message is much bigger than the number of messages. That's the kind of setting we are thinking of. So therefore, whatever communication cost you have, it'll be dominated by the download cost because the message itself is so much bigger than everything else. So that's why we will focus mainly on the download cost um, in this problem. So that's the setting the picture shows two databases, but you can have any number n. We have a user that wants, that generates some uniform index theta from one to k. And that means he wants message w theta. In order to do so, he sends the queries. The queries should not reveal anything about theta to any individual database. And it's important here that the databases do not communicate with each other. Uh, so just marginally, each query has to be independent um, of theta. Now the databases send their answers, and from the answers, the user gets the message W theta. So what, um, what is it that we have to optimize here? Really what we're trying to optimize is the size of the download. We want the download to be as small as possible. And so we define a rate, because again, information theory, we like to think of rates, um, and that rate is the number of bits of desired message normalized by the total number of bits downloaded. So the numerator is here is just a normalizing factor. 
really what we're trying to optimize is not the number of bits of desired message that's kind of given, but rather the number of bits that we download. So what we're trying to do is just minimize the download. So just to say that it's feasible, obviously one thing you could do is just download everything. Uh, if you did that, then the rate would be one over K because in order to download one message, you're downloading K messages. So that would be extremely inefficient if the number of messages was reasonably large. Um, so, um, so the thing we're interested in is the optimal rate or the maximum rate from information theoretic perspective, um, which means not just order optimal, but exactly optimal. Okay, so uh, we want to know what's the exact uh, maximum value that this rate can take. And so let me just state directly what the result says, and then we will try to see why it makes sense. So the result says the maximum rate you can have, um, or if you want to say what's the minimum download you can have, then just look at the reciprocal of that. Uh, so the maximum rate or the capacity of PIR, when you have n databases or n servers, uh, each storing all k messages, it's this expression. This many um, bits of desired message can be retrieved per bit of download. And nothing more than this can be done. Okay, so let's understand intuitively uh, what, what that is about. So, um, so in general, we have n databases, database, each database storing every, all the messages. Suppose, so this is just intuition, so here I will just be drawing pictures, really no math here. Uh, suppose I want the message W1 and let this circle represent, this gray circle represents W1. So because, well, let's say there are four databases in the picture I see four. So what do I do? Well, the obvious thing I could do is just divide the circle into four parts and ask each database to send me that one fourth part, right? So now I've divided the circle into these four parts. Now that would of course make the scheme, I mean, it would not be private at all because I'm only asking for the desired message. So in order to maintain privacy, I have to pretend that I could have wanted the other messages. So for example, if I have a purple message, then I should also ask for one fourth of the circle of the purple circle from each of the databases. And similarly, if I have a red message, then fourth of that, and if I have a green one, fourth of that as well. So I have to ask for all of these things from each database. So how do I do this efficiently is the question. So the first thing you notice is that, well, I want message W1. So the gray circle is the one I want. So I have to download different parts of that circle from the different databases so that in the end, I can put together this entire circle and reconstruct my message. On the other hand, the other messages, I don't really care about them. I'm using it just because I don't want to reveal which message I want. So I don't need to download different parts of the circle from different servers. So for example, for the purple message, I could just download the same part of the circle from each server. And because the servers don't talk to each other, they will not know uh, that I'm downloading really the same part. So that's the first thing you notice that uh, for the gray circle, I'm downloading different parts from each server, but for the purple, green, or red circles, I'm downloading the same part from, uh, from every server. Now that's important, but that by itself is not enough because if I was just downloading these four parts separately, then it didn't really help whether I was downloading them uh, the same thing or the different things. So what, is important now is I have to somehow create interference alignment, meaning that I want to download these things, but I don't want to download them separately. I want to download some linear combinations of them. So I want to again make it as compact as possible. So I'm downloading as few equations as possible and yet be able to recover my gray circle, be able to reconstruct that. So that's the main question in PIR, how to achieve this optimal alignment uh, between the desired message and the undesired messages that are there because I have to pretend that I possibly want those as well. So how do we um, find the optimal scheme or what is the optimal scheme? Let me just present it for a very simple case. So here I have two databases and two messages. All right, it's a very simple setting. Um, two, database, two databases, two messages. Um, seems I'm again going a little longer than I expect. So, um, all right. So what, what does the user do? I have two messages, W1 and W2. Each message is made up of you know, a number of bits. What the user does is first, he privately generates a permutation of each message's bits. And so the pi of W1 is just represents some permutation of the bits of message one and pi of W2, which is a different independent permutation uh, for, the, for the bits of message two. 
And these permutations are generated I mean, privately by the user, so the database does not know what these are. Then the scheme works based on um, three principles, and those principles are uh, that we try to achieve symmetry across databases, symmetry across messages, and we try to use site information to um, retrieve useful information. So let me quickly explain what these principles mean. So in this case, suppose the user wants message one. So theta equals one, user wants W1. So he wants the bits A1, A2, A3, A4, and so on. He does not want the bits B1, B2, and so on. So, well, he wants message one, so he asks database one for one of his desired bits. So he asks for A1. Then because he has to have symmetry across databases, he will also ask database two for one of his desired bits. Next principle, symmetry across messages, without which there would be no privacy. So he has also to ask for a bit of the other message, just to keep things symmetric between the two messages. At this point, you notice the user has downloaded some useless information. This B1 and B2, he doesn't really need. He just had to download it because he was trying to keep his desired message private. But is this completely useless or is it possible to somehow make use of it? And that's where the third principle comes in. You use the site information to get useful information. So for example, because the user already knows B2, because he will get that from database two, he asks now database one to send him a sum of B2 and a desired message bit. Now, as far as database one is concerned, you just, the user is just asking for you know, the sum of one bit from one message and one bit from the other message. He doesn't know which one is desired and which one is not desired because the database does not know what you got from the other database. So that allows the user to recover another desired bit. And same thing he can do with the other database as well because he already knows B1 from here. So he can ask for A4 plus B1, which will allow him to retrieve A4. All right, and that scheme will work the same way if the situation was switched. If he wanted message W2, it would be again the same scheme. So the structure of the scheme will not reveal which message the user is looking for. And that's why the scheme is perfectly private. In every case, the user is asking for one bit of A, one bit of B, and a sum of a different bit of A and a different bit of B. Okay, so uh, that's always what the database sees. Another thing to note here from our circle analogy before, if you notice that, um, for the desired message, the user is downloading different bits from the two databases. For example, if user wanted message one, then he's downloading A1 and A3 from database one and A2 and A4 from database two. But for the undesired bits, he's downloading the same information from the two databases, B1 and B2 from here, B1 and B2 also from here. Okay, so that's the part where we said the purple circle is the same. From, it's the same part of the purple circle that we download from every database. But the gray circle is different. Uh, that's important. All right, so what is the rate of this scheme? Well, from each database, the user downloads three bits. So that's a total of six database, uh, six bits downloaded, from which the user is able to recover four um, desired bits, A1, A2, A3, A4. So the rate is four over six for this scheme. And later we'll see that this is also the optimal rate, information theoretically optimal, meaning there cannot be any other scheme that does better than this. All right, so that was a simple example. I'll just do one more example and then the pattern would be pretty clear because the scheme I don't think is that difficult to grasp. So it's pretty simple. So now let's just say, what if there were three messages? How would things change? Uh, so again, the user would generate some random permutation of the bits of each message and we will label them as AIs, BIs, and CIs. And again, follow the same three principles. So suppose the user wants message one, so he asks for a bit of his desired message from each database, so A1 and A2. Now to maintain um, message symmetry, he also has to ask for a bit of every message. So he will ask for B1C1 from database one and B2C2 from database two. Now he will use the sign information that he got. So, so from database two, he already got this useless information B2 and C2. So he will try to make it useful by combining it uh, as part of his queries from database one. So he asks for A3 plus B2, A4 plus C2, which gives him A3 and A4. Um, now at this point, the scheme is, I mean, he can do the same thing with the other database as well to maintain symmetry. However, at this point, the scheme is not private because database one notices that the user is asking for A plus B, A plus C, but no B plus C. So there's some asymmetry. It seems like you're more interested in A than B or C. So that would um, compromise the privacy that the user also has to download some B plus C just to make things even. So he downloads some other B plus C and he does that from both databases. So at this point, again, he has some useless information. What does he do with this B4 plus C4? It seems useless. So the way to use it is 
So again, create a query that uses B4 and plus C4, which he already knows, and combine it with the desired symbol that he can now retrieve based on that. And he can do that for both messages. So that's, and at that point, the scheme is symmetric, everything is um, complete. So that's the scheme for this setting. Um, the structure of the scheme, again, does not reveal anything about what message you want. Therefore, the scheme is perfectly private. The rate of the scheme is eight over 14 because the user is able to download, um, retrieve desired bits A1 through A8 while downloading a total of 14 bits because it's seven bits from each database. So the rate is eight over 14. And once again, you notice that the desired bits that you download from each database are the same, I'm mean, sorry, are different. From database one, you're getting A1, A3, A4, A7. From database two, you're getting A2, A5, A6, A8. But the undesired bits, the interference bits that you're getting from each database are the same. B1, C1, B2, C2, C3, same here, B1, C1, B2, C2, C3. And B3 plus C3, well, B3 plus C3 here, and B4 plus C4, B4 plus C4. So it kind of is doing exactly what we wanted to do intuitively. And once again, this rate is also optimal. Um, I will defer the converse for a while. So what, uh, so far I've just shown the achievability and uh, I'm assuming that these two examples kind of make it clear how you would have the achievable scheme in general. So this is the rate achieved by the scheme when you have N databases and K messages. Now, of course, it's an information theoretic result. So it also needs a converse, a proof of optimality that nothing better can be done. So I will go to the proof of optimality when I talk about locally decodable codes, because as, as it turns out, that proof of optimality is very strong. It proves optimality not just for PIR, it also proves optimality for the corresponding problem of locally decodable codes as well. So I will um, deal with that in that context. All right, um, so let me try to make up some time in this slide. Uh, this is just summarizing, uh, um, more recent works, uh, actually not the most recent works because I think it, there's a lot, lot more stuff this year that, that's not in this slide. But anyway, these are works based on capacity of PIR, uh, at least a sampling of them. So aside from the capacity of PIR, we also know the capacity of PIR when you have T privacy constraints. That means even if T servers or up to T servers collude, they still learn nothing about the user's desired message index. We also know the capacity, well, in this case, actually, no, we don't know the capacity, but we do have some bounds for um, the case where the storage is coded. So that's MDS PIR. Then you could also have a combination of coded storage and T privacy, that's MDS T PIR. Um, you could have settings where you require the data that is stored at the servers to be secure in a way that even if up to X servers colluded among themselves, they will not find out what data is being stored. And that data is stored through some secret sharing scheme, basically with some threshold of X. So up to X databases will not find out anything. Um, uh, the capacity is also known for symmetric PIR, which is a form of oblivious transfer where not only does the database not learn what the user wants, but also it's required that the user does not learn anything beyond what he wants. So nothing besides the message that he wants to retrieve, nothing else should be revealed to the user. That's symmetric PIR or oblivious transfer. Um, also the capacity is known for multi-round PIR, where it's possible for the user to send query, get a response and based on the response, decide what next query to send and so you can have an interactive scheme. It turns out that that doesn't help. The capacity of PIR remains the same in, in multi-round case same as single round case. Similarly, the capacity of PIR is known for multiple messages when you want to download or retrieve multiple messages. It's also known, uh, actually no, in this case it's also open, in some cases it's known, but generally open, when you have upload constraints, meaning how much information you can upload. Um, locally, the same situation because these problems are connected. Upload constraint PIR is essentially the same problem as locally decodable codes or repudiative information retrieval. That's a problem where the privacy constraint is relaxed in a way that um, you no longer, I mean, it's okay now for the database to have a suspicion that this is the message you want, but he should not be able to prove that that's the message you want. That's much weaker constraint. Um, so that's repudiative IR. Uh, similarly, PIR capacity has been found with storage constraints, site information, or settings where the user doesn't want to directly download a message, but rather wants to download some function of the messages. So that's private computation. That capacity is also known. Uh, and then there's really too many settings for me to summarize here. They include things like eavesdroppers and Byzantine servers. And those have been explored as well. 
All right, so uh, is there any quick question I can take before? If anyone has a question they can ask in the Q&A box. Uh, it's fine, we can do it at the end also. I just wanted to check in case, <laughs> you know, things have stopped making sense already, then maybe I can go and clarify something. Otherwise, there actually is, is one question uh, um, from Evgeny, uh, see if I can unmute. All right, uh, Evgeny, you're allowed to talk. <laughs> uh, sure, yeah. Um, no, I was just wondering, there is a lot of work, this is super exciting stuff, but, uh, there are a lot of papers, I guess, of uh, Yuval, uh, Sergei Hanin, and so on. Um, I guess they're in a different setting. I'm trying to see, do your results strictly beat those results, or are they incomparable? Um, those are not capacity results. So, right. um, um, I mean, I have not seen anything that I can directly compare. Um, for one thing, we are mainly focused on the download cost. Um, so far, the upload cost is not even a part of the equation because we're just trying to optimize the rate, which is defined as essentially the reciprocal of the download cost. Um, so, and also these are exact optimality results, right? And information theoretic optimality results. So as far as I know, all the results I've seen have been um, order-wise, uh, like, you know, with the O notation. <laughs> so. Uh, that's very different from what we're doing. And certainly, if you look at just the rate, yes, this scheme will beat the rate of any known scheme because the scheme didn't exist before. And uh, but whether it beats it by a huge thing or just the same order wise, it's the same. Maybe order wise is probably the same thing. I don't know. But, but you're saying the main difference, if I understood correctly, you're saying the main difference is you don't count uh, the complexity of representing the query, only the responses. So yes, the query is exactly. so free. And I guess if you count, and those papers count both, like total yes. communication. Right. Because the, how you count them depends on how big the message is, right? And we're saying the messages are big. If you assume the messages are small, then of course the upload and download become comparable. Mm -hmm. But if the messages are huge, then the download is by far the heavier of the, of the two. Nice. Thank you. That's the assumption. Perhaps on, on a related uh, note, so it seems that your notions are inherently, you talk about long messages. I think that yes. this is something that was less studied in the, in the CS community and mm -hmm. people are focused on only, you know, one bit uh, messages. So right, I want exactly. to, That's why for, for, your, for your positive, for your positive results, mm -hmm. like how long the messages should be as a function of the number of databases and the, and, and the, oh, yeah, yeah. the number that, of messages. That, that is, uh, um, it is exponential, if I remember correctly. Actually, we are able to also characterize the query length. Um, um, yeah, the size of the query, the upload cost as well. You will see in the next part of the talk. Uh, but as far as the size of the messages, I think it is exponential. Uh, I, can, uh, I can check later and confirm it, but I think it is exponential. And we will see some result, strong result on the size of the query in the next part. Okay. And there, there's one more question in the chat box. Well, I guess while we're taking a, a question break, um, anonymous attendee says, uh, it seems that the capacity gets worse with more databases. Why would you use more databases? No, it does not get worse. Uh, it actually improves, of course. There's an inverse outside. <laughs> Maybe that might be confusing. Because you yeah. see N in the de denominator, N is the number of databases. You see that in the denominator, so it looks like it's getting worse with N. But outside the big parentheses, you see there's an inverse. So the capacity is the reciprocal of that. So uh, it, it gets better with the number of databases. OK. Shall I continue? Okay. All right, so, uh, okay, uh, time-wise, I'm not doing great. All right, so next part, because we said there's very strong connections between PIR and locally decodable codes, so let's explore now that we can say something about 
uh, capacity of PIR. What does that mean for locally decodable codes? So again, I will just present it through simple examples. So here I have a code that maps three source symbols, W1, W2, W3, to six code symbols, X1 to X6. And it's a locally decodable code because each source symbol for this example can be decoded from two um, code symbols specifically. So that has locality of two. And those two symbols would be called a decoding set for that um, source symbol. So for example, source symbol W1 could be decoded from X1 and X4, or X2 and X5, or X3 and X6. So these are three decoding sets for W1. And similarly, you have three decoding sets for W2 and three decoding sets for W3. So that's a locally decodable code. In fact, this code you notice has some nice property. So for example, if I choose source symbols W1, and I randomly pick one of these decoding sets, then you notice that every code symbol has equal probability of getting chosen. Such a code is called a smooth code, and such codes have um, advantages in, in their resilience to errors. So that's why they're interesting. Now quickly, what is the relationship between locally decodable codes and PIR? So let's use the same example. Imagine that you have two servers, and we will associate these code symbols x1, x2, x3 with server one, and x4, x5, x6 with server two. Now, um, in this problem, suppose we have an upload constraint. So upload becomes important here. So what, what constraint do we have? The constraint that we have is that from each server, the user can only ask for one of three things. So that means the upload is limited to a three array symbol. So from server one, the user can either ask for x1, x2, or x3. And similarly from server two, the user can either ask for x4, x5, or x6. So that obviously becomes a PIR scheme very easily because all the user does is just randomly ask for x1 or x2 or x3 from server one. And then based on which message he wants, he chooses the corresponding neighbor and asks uh, for that from server two. So for example, if he wants the W2, which means he wants one of these decoding sets and suppose he chose x2, then x2's red neighbor is x6. So he will ask for x6 from server two. So that's the PIR scheme. Um, what is the correspondence between locally decodable codes and PIR? Well, um, if you look at the size of the upload, so here we had a three array symbol. That means we could download three things from each server. In general, suppose you can download Q things from each server, so you have a Q array query. Then the length of the locally decodable code would be Q times the number of servers, so Q times N. Um, so obviously the length of the code depends on the upload cost of PIR scheme. So if you wanna study the length of the locally decodable codes, you have to study upload constraint PIR. On the other hand, the size of the code symbol, how big are these symbols? So that's another very important distinction. We don't assume that the source symbols are necessarily the same size as the code symbols. In fact, the very question we want to explore is how big do these um, code symbols have to be for this code to work? or how small can they be? Because we want, this, we want to find the smallest possible that they can be. And that of course is related to the download cost of PIR because after all, um, this is exactly what we're downloading. These code symbols are what the user downloads in the PIR scheme. All right, so because in, we notice in the PIR formulation, we focus on the download. We were trying to minimize the download cost. So it makes sense that in the corresponding question as we translate it to locally decodable codes, the corresponding question would be, what's the smallest size of the code alphabet, given whatever decoding sets constraints that we have. And the point here is that, yeah, the, so the code alphabet will always allow you to make anything feasible. So whatever decoding sets you come up with, there's always a code alphabet size that will allow you to do that. The question is, what's the smallest size though? And that's what we want to know, okay? Um, so let me take an example um, to make that point a little more clear. So the question we're interested in is, what's the smallest possible size of code symbols normalized by the size of source symbols, just to minimize the number of parameters. So without loss of generality, let's assume the source symbols had size one. And size is measured by entropy here. So it's just normalized to one. And what we want to do is find the minimum possible size of the code symbols, that is entropy of X, which is entropy of X1, X2, X3, each of them have the same entropy because they have the same size. So some observations, so for example, given this decoding structure, it's obvious that I don't need the code symbols to be bigger than three. Because if a, if a code symbol is, has a size as big as three source symbols, then each code symbol can store everything. Each code symbol can contain all the source symbols. 
So of course, from any code symbol, you'll be able to decode everything because the code symbol is so big, it contains everything in itself. So obviously we don't need the code, code symbol to be more than three. So that's an obvious upper bound. Similarly, you can argue some trivial lower bounds as well. So we can see that the optimal size of this code symbol cannot be more than, I mean, must be more than half because that's a lower bound. Why should it be more than half? Because suppose it, it, the code symbol had only size half of the source symbol. Then because from two code symbols, we can decode the source symbol. So that means there's no room for any interference. Each of X1 and X4, for example, have to be half of W1. They cannot contain any W2 or W3, which means I cannot use X1 then to be uh, somehow a decoding set for W2. So that means half is obviously not feasible. So the question is, what is the best, meaning the smallest possible size of the code symbol? For this particular setting, given these particular decoding sets, um, again, information theoretically through some in entropy inequalities, you can prove that the optimal size is one, meaning in this case, the best thing you can have is the code symbols are as big as the source symbols. In general, that's not the case, and we want to answer the question in general. Okay, so here, we will prove the converse, um, meaning an impossibility result. For this result, we will in fact relax our, con our condition of locally decodable um, codes to not just smooth codes, but something much more general than that, because the only condition we have is that every code symbol should be contained in at least one decoding set for every source symbol. Okay, so that's all we require for this converse. All right, so remember we have normalized the source symbols to size one, and we're trying to find what's the smallest possible size for the code symbols. And because it gets tiresome to write HX all the time, we will use the symbol D to mean the same thing. And also because D refers to the download in the PIR case. So this converse in fact is a converse, not just for, for locally decodable codes, it's also a converse with a PIR scheme that we saw before. And because they're connected, it turns out the same argument works for both. It's a pretty simple argument. Uh, so again, let's use that example uh, where we had three source symbols, W1, W2, W3. And remember, blue color represents decoding sets for message one, red color for message two, and three, I'm uh, sorry, green color for message three. Um, so, and this code has locality two. So how do we prove the converse? Well, start with any uh, code symbol, let's say XA. And based on starting from this code symbol, we build a tree. So first we say from XA, there must be a coding, uh, there must be a decoding set that allows us to decode W1. So because here locality is two, so th there must be another symbol, another code symbol XB, so is that XA and XB together give us W1. Um, and similarly, from XA, there must be some decoding set that allows me to decode W2, so XA, XC is that decoding set, and that red edge shows that from here I can decode W2. And similarly, XB must be a part of some decoding set that allows me to decode W2 as well. Notice I'm not saying that these symbols have to be distinct. Some of these symbols may be the same symbol. That doesn't matter for the proof. Just that there exists some decoding set. That's all I'm saying. Because remember, that's the only condition I have, that every code symbol must appear in some decoding set for every source symbol. And so similarly, I can go down this tree and say, well, XA must also be a part of a decoding set for the message W3. And similarly, XC must also be a part of some decoding set. And XB must be a part of it. And XD must be a part of it. So that's the tree. And I'm done because in this case, there are only three, uh, three source symbols. That's the entire tree. All right, so from here, we prove our impossibility result. Um, okay, so maybe this one I will go through, but actually what this is saying is almost trivial. But so let's see what, what it is saying. Well, so W3, which, which is look, we're looking at this decoding set from which we can decode W3. So W3 has size one. So that's equal to the mutual information between W3 and XA and XE. Expand mutual information, that's the difference of entropies. And then the joint entropy is less than the sum of entropies. This joint entropy can be expressed as the chain rule of entropies, drop the negative term, end up here. And this gives us this bound. Okay, that if you wanna look at the derivation, that that's what it is. But intuitively what it's saying is something actually trivial. What is it saying? So let's look at the picture a little, let's make it a little more obvious. What we're saying is, from XA and XE, the total size I have is 2D, or two, of, two times H of X, because each of them has size H of X. That's the total, I remember earlier picture we had where we started talking about dimension. So this is the dimension we're living in, because all we have is a, XA and XE, so that's 2D dimension. In that dimension, I have the desired message HW3 that occupies some of those dimensions, and that's the size of the message, so HW3. The remaining dimension 
has to contain all the interference. Because remember, interference and desired symbol cannot overlap. That's an information theoretic fact. And that's really what this, all this is saying on all these entropies and mutual informations. That's all they're saying. And in this case, what we're saying is, well, the, end, the interference is at least the entropy of Xa given W3. Because whatever is contained in the symbol Xa after you're given W3, that is the interference. Notice we're not saying Xa and Xe given W3 because maybe something that's contained in Xe was the same as what's contained in Xa, then we'll be double counting things. So we don't wanna do that. So that's why we're limiting the interference just to one of the symbols. So that's all this inequality is saying, that the size of interference that I get from one of the symbols cannot be more than the total download minus the desired part, because that's all that the interference can occupy. And you can, of course, prove something similar for each decoding set. So that's the first step of the proof. And the rest of the proof just climbs up the tree to do the same thing. So for the next step of the proof, we just say, well, now let's assume that W3 is gone because everything is conditioned on W3. So it, the problem becomes as if now we have only two symbols, W1 and W2. So in, in a sense, all the entropies and everything will be conditioned on W3 from this point on. And then you go through the derivation. It's exactly the same derivation as before, except everything is conditioned on W3. If you draw the picture, also it will be the same thing. So the total download you have from Xa and Xe, Xc is this much, from which you get this desired information. So the interference cannot be bigger than what's, what's left in terms of the dimensions. And that's this inequality. And you can do that for every decoding set at the second level. Finally, you climb the tree at the top and now you're with W1. I uh, will not repeat that. It's the same argument over all over again, except now you're conditioned on both W2 and W3 because everything below is already given. Uh, so that gives you this bound. Okay, let's rearrange this bound. Um, that gives you the converse for this particular example, which shows that the size of the source symbol has to be at least seven over eight. When you add these, you get seven over eight. If you did this in general, not just for this example, then this is the bound you would get. The size of the source symbol sorry, the size of the code symbol cannot be smaller than this quantity. All right. And by the way, this is also a converse for the PIR scheme because you can use the same arguments for PIR as well. So that's a bound. And then previously we saw an achievable scheme. It turns out the two match. So therefore you can prove that this is indeed the optimal size of the code symbol for locally decodable codes. And the achievable scheme follows from PIR. Uh, so we know the optimal size of the code symbol uh, just some observations. Remember that we didn't, we never used the smooth property. So this optimal size result is true for a much broader class of codes where the only requirement is that every code symbol is part of a decoding set for every source symbol. Um, it also applies the converse for PIR. Um, one thing you would note here is that we never talked about the code length. We just said, well, uh, without any constraint on code length, the only constraint was this thing shown in red, that every code symbol is contained in at least one decoding set. Just based on that constraint, we said this is the optimal size of the code, I mean, meaning the smallest possible size of the code symbol. Um, so in general, if you place constraints on the code length, then this, may, this optimal size may not be achievable. You may need bigger so, uh, uh, code symbols than this. And that is a big open problem, an important open problem. Um, so that problem is still open, but like I said, there's something we can say about the minimum code length. We can say, what is the minimum code length needed to achieve this? So like we said here, that this is the smallest code symbol that you can have, but for what code length is this achievable? And that we can answer exactly. Again, not order-wise, exactly. We can show that, that the code length is exactly n to the k. You will need that code length. Nothing less than that will do, and that is enough. All right, so how do we prove that that is the minimum code length? Uh, turns out that is also a result that is available for free based on what we've already seen. Why? Because if we just go through the same proof that we saw before, all we have to notice in that proof is that if the bounds, so in that proof, remember we are proving an impossibility result, so we are proving some bounds. Now later we said that, okay, suppose, uh, we said these bounds are tight because we can actually find the code that achieves these. So what does it mean that these bounds were tight? It means that each of these inequalities must be tight. So therefore, for example, what it means is the entropy of Xa and Xe, meaning these two symbols from which we can decode W3, is equal to the sum of, these of, sum of their entropies, which means these symbols are independent, which means they're distinct. And that's the argument that we apply over and over throughout this tree to show that every symbol in this tree has to be distinct if it achieves the capacity. So therefore, 
the number of symbols in this code cannot be smaller than n to the k. All right, so that gives us a lower bound on the length of the code. Now, the achievability, how do we show that you can actually achieve it? That is a non-trivial question, and I will completely skip that part. Uh, just, I will point out, I'll just give you an example of what the optimal construction looks like. It is based on the PIR scheme that I showed you before, but it requires a lot more work to carefully design it because we have to be, um, because this is the upload optimal scheme. So we cannot be just careless and just waste resources in our upload. So that, therefore, this scheme has to be designed much, much more carefully than, than before. So just to give you an example, what, what, what the solution is for that setting. So remember, are the example that we've been carrying through was the example where we have three source symbols, X1, W1, W2, W3, and we wanted to know what's the smallest code um, that would allow those decoding sets. And it turns out, as we saw before, the code length has to be seven over eight. So what does that mean? It means if each source symbol was eight bits, then each code symbol would be seven bits. That's why the normalized length of the code symbol is seven over eight bits. So these are the eight code symbols. Notice how many codes do we need? What is the length of the code? It's eight, which is n to the k, because n is two here, k is three here, because we have locality two and we have three source symbols. So we obviously need eight coded symbols. Each code symbol has the smallest possible size that any code symbol have, regardless of any code length constraints. And that is seven over eight. So this is what that code looks like. Um, so I will skip the details of how this code was achieved. Uh, just point out the previous example that we saw where it was the same decoding constraints, but um, uh, the code length was only six. So in that case, we could not achieve the seven over eight. And the optimal size of the code symbol there was one. It was not seven over eight. It was worse because our code length was smaller. So in general, if you, make the, if you force the code length to be small, then the size of the code will increase. The, I mean, the size of the code symbols will increase. All right, so let, I think I'm over time. So let me conclude just quickly with, uh, so like I said, the PIR problem is interesting for us because it has many connections. One of the things it has, or another thing that it has connection uh, to is the problem of secure distributed matrix multiplication, uh, where what we want is the storage to be secure and that we achieve by taking the messages or the data that's stored, that is the W symbols. These are what we are storing, mixing it with some uniform noise X noise symbols that guarantees X secure storage. And then for the same thing with the queries, each query we want to protect um, against collusion among up to T servers. So each query is mixed with T noise symbols. And then what, the, what you download is from each server is just the sum of these products. So S1, Q1, S2, Q2, and so on. Again, skip the details. What, what it boils down to is after you collect all the downloads from all the servers, you find that all the desired symbols, meaning Q times W, those are the desired symbols, will appear along these vectors. These vectors are the Cauchy terms. This is a Cauchy short, oh, sorry, Cauchy um, Vandermon matrix. These columns, which are the Cauchy terms, contain the desired symbols. And there's L of them, which means we can retrieve L desired symbols. All these Vandermon terms represent these column vectors that contain interference and their number is fixed. That's the most interesting thing about this, that there's only X plus T such columns. So what this scheme does is it allows you to retrieve L desired symbols, and you can choose L to be large, keep making it larger, without increasing the size of interference. The interference will always occupy only X plus T dimensions, no more. And you can keep downloading more desired symbols. Um, and so and even more interesting than that, like after all, what I was going for was a connection to other things. It turns out that the same PIR scheme, if I replace W1 through WL with A1 through AL and the queries with B1 through BL, then it becomes a matrix, a secure distributed matrix multiplication scheme that allows me to recover the matrix products A1, B1, A2, B2, AL, BL from distributed servers without revealing to any server what these matrices are. And not only does it give me a scheme, in fact, it gives me a scheme that recovers the best state of art schemes that exist already uh, as a special case. So it's not just a scheme, it's as good as the best schemes. Uh, in fact, it improves them in some special cases as well. Um, so that's surprising and, and that just uh, as a concluding remark, it just reminds us why we study PIR is because it has connections to other things and maybe by uh, learning the structure of optimal alignments in PIR, we can learn something about a lot of other problems that PIR is connected to. So that's uh, the end of the talk. I'm four minutes over. <laughs> All right, I'll take questions if there's any. 
Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so uh, any questions? So did I, I'm not sure I interpreted the bounce correctly, but uh, was one of the results that for capacity achieving uh, LDCs or peers, um, the upload cost would have to be as large as the database size because it's, uh, is, is that a right interpretation? Upload cost would have to be as large as the database size. Um, no, because I mean, so database size depends on the size of the message, right? If I make the size bigger, I mean, if it's the message becomes bigger, then the database becomes bigger. But upload. Sorry, I meant k. I meant the number. I meant the number of messages k. Um, I, I guess I, I guess I'm thinking in this in the in my head always the messages are bits, which is the wrong way to think. Oh yeah, yeah. So if this message sorry. is just one bit, then you, the da database size is. Uh, um, we basically have k bits, so it's 2k, 2 to the k, right? And the upload cost is, actually if each message is just one bit, that scheme would not work in the first place because that scheme does require the message size to be big as well. Uh, but because it's saying that the upload size has to be n to the k, where n is the locality. Um, so if you have locality three and you know k messages, then you need three to the k, that size upload. Um, in order to have the smallest possible download, right? I guess I have a, a question, so, or maybe a pair of questions. So mm -hmm. first part, so in, for your converse results, your impossibility results, uh, are, are there any assumptions on this scheme? Like, it, does it have to be linear or? Just any, any. Oh, no, no, no. That's an information theoretic converse. So okay. there are, the only assumption there is that um, every code symbol, I mean, so yeah, every code symbol must be useful for every um, source symbol. So there must not be that, okay, if I want message one, then I will never ask for this code symbol. That shouldn't happen. They don't have to be smooth, but just that there should be nothing that is just never used. Right. Got it. That's the only constraint. And is there any hope, uh, I, I guess, in particular in your proof of like the um, uh, the the, minute, the best code length obtainable when you have the optimal uh, symbol size in, in that result? Is there is there any hope of backing off by a little bit? Like say, say I don't want the optimal symbol size, but I want yes. that. That's a very good question. In fact, <laughs> that's very much something that we are still working on. So, uh, I mean, just last week uh, with Hwasun, we were exchanging a ton of emails because we thought we had some idea in the end, it turned out it didn't work. <laughs> but that's the kind of thing we're working on these days as well. Yeah. So there is hope, but I don't know if that's false hope or not, <laughs> but there are things that we think could work. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Although, um, actually, I'll, I'll give priority to the Q&A, sorry. Okay, so I guess we can uh, address Yevgeny's uh, question first. Um, Yevgeny, let me allow you to talk. Go ahead. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, uh, yeah sorry, uh, I guess my question wasn't clear, but maybe I misinterpreted your distributed matrix result. So the question which seems kind of interesting, let's say if the servers have a share, uh, let's say a long database, let's say binary, and I have a sparse vector, um, and I want to compute the inner product, essentially this uh, you know, sparse linear combination of, uh, um, um, of the server's bits. Uh, are you saying your results would get uh, a private way for me to do it so that the small coalition of servers will not learn my sparse vector? And you know, the communication is small, uh, sublinear in the database size. Uh, so this it will allow you to do it. I don't know if it will make use of sparsity, though because the scheme really is just designed to multiply matrices or vectors. Um, we have not tried to use any sparsity. And well, what, I, what I'm saying is if K, if the database size K is, let's say big, and my vector is, I don't know, like square root of K or cube root of, or like much, much smaller than K. So in principle, the inner product is just one bit. So insecure protocol will be just to say, to, to send 
you know, essentially a sparse description of my vector, get one bit back. Uh, so I definitely want Sublini and K communication, but I want to have some privacy. I'm curious if your results is it directly or indirectly applied to this setting so that, you know, the total communication is much smaller than database size. Uh, but I want privacy. Um, I think service. that is true. I think that is true. The download here does not scale with K. So, yeah, uh, even though we're not explicitly trying to make use of any sparsity, but it is true that um, the computation here, um, the K could be arbitrarily, arbitrarily large, but that does not change um, the scheme because what you're downloading is just the inner product, right, of S and Q. So S and Q may each be huge, very long vectors. The, de the size of S and Q depends on mm -hmm. you know, the size of the database, but you're downloading just the inner products of them. So what you're downloading is still very small. But the uploads, are the uploads K or are the upload? uh, uploads? Yeah, again, upload is something we didn't think about. Upload. Yeah, upload probably here will be not very efficient. It probably might be just whatever is the worst case you can imagine yeah. because there is no attempt here to right. make the upload good. I think you know, it's, it's very interesting, so I'll try to find it in the... Oh, but you're saying the paper is not out yet. It's, uh, no, no, it's it is out. It is out. It's, uh, okay. it's an archive and also okay. on my website, it's just listed. Okay. Thank you. Adam, you had... I, I had a quick question, I think. Um, as I just try to digest the results and what it means to think about like large symbols and, and sort of rate in the sense you're talking about. Can I, can, do you, do your results say anything about the kind of, um, I guess it sort of corresponds to the like additive overhead as opposed to the multiplicative term. And so what specifically like, suppose my symbols really happen to be small. Um, in order to, you, the achievable, like the, the rate statement still makes sense. Like you could still ask for the, how small the uh, uh, code symbols can be. Right. Uh, but for your achieving the schemes that you described that achieve this rate, you need the field size, I guess, to be big enough that you can pack in the right kinds of linear combinations. Um, in terms of field size, they're not that bad. I mean, at least the, you can use fields of characteristic two is what I mean, but um, the size itself may be big. Each right. Each. Yeah. Not characteristic, but like you need, you know, you need to work, be able to, like enough space to do the linear algebra. It's kind of like with secret sharing schemes. Um, uh, yeah, so that's what I was uh, pointing out, that the kind of algebra we need, it turns out it requires very little because all we have are sums. There's no, if you notice in the, in the one example that I had for the achievable scheme, all you're downloading are sums. So mm. never, never a need for a higher field in that sense. So you're just downloading sums of bits and that's it. I see. So there's actually like, so you could get it to work for. But like, you do need a quite a few bits, but yeah, the, all you're doing is just sums or sums of some subsets of the bits. Uh, that's all you're done. Well, may, maybe I'm confused. So what, why do you need a lot of bits in that case? To get the optimal things. So, I mean, I can just uh, go to that Yeah, here, right here. So that's the example, right? So this is the code symbol, for example, X1. So remember, the, there are three messages. Message W1 is made up of A1, A2, A3, A4. These are the bits that it's made up. Oh, I see. Right? So in order for my um, code symbol to have length 7 over 8, so I, I choose the message to have size 8 bits, and then the um, code symbol has size 7 bits. And this scheme obviously requires uh, each message to have size 8 bits. So if each message had only one bit, then, then the scheme wouldn't work. It does require each message to have eight bits. But other than that, I mean, in terms of what we are actually, the, what the scheme is doing is just sums of, you know, so A3 plus C2, B3 plus C3 and so on. So is, is, there some re is there any reason to think it's optimal when the, like you could use this scheme for shorter messages, right? Like just by wasting space. Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Right, and is there any reason to, think that somehow that extra space would be necessary here that like the you know is there does it do the results say anything about the lower bounds do they say anything in that in that case or are they 
you know, I mean, maybe, I mean, even eight bits is not very big. So it's not like a, it's not that big a deal. I'm just, I was just kind of curious where, where, where the limit, you know, what the limitations are. I mean, this eight is again, I think like n to the k. So as those things become bigger, this will become bigger too. I see. Um, yeah, and yeah, you can always waste some resources by just replacing these some bits with zeros, for example, if you don't have those bits. But then, of course, there's a, it would not be possible to prove an information theoretic optimality guarantee. Um, right. Generally, those entropy bounds do not uh, work so well with limited sized alphabet. I see. Okay. Then it will have to be a combinatorial bound, really, too. Right. To prove yeah, it. I guess the situation is somewhat similar with uh, secret sharing. OK, thanks. Hi. Hello? Hi, Amos. Uh, I have a comment. Uh, if you want uh, the, the capacity to be constant, you can use the PR uh, protocols with uh, constant size uh, answer. If you use, uh, for instance, uh, a two server uh, protocol with one bit answer, that will give you a capacity of two. And in this side, in this case, uh, uh, the size of the query is the, the, the size of the, uh, the, the number of messages. If you want three servers answering one uh, bit, you can use the FMN cost scheme and the size of the query, which uh, corresponds to the length of the code, will be quite short. So already without any more optimization, PR with uh, short answers will give you a, a good uh, constant uh, capacity. Exactly, yeah. So those are extreme, like I said, that is a, I, I, as I pointed out, that is one of the big open problems for me that for, for a given upload constraint, what is the best that can be done? And we, like you mentioned, uh, there are a number of achievable schemes. From our side, what we're trying to do is to prove impossibility results. So we're not so much trying to find good schemes, but rather just proves what is it that cannot be done. So our, our, all, all of our, all our focus is currently just on trying to prove impossibility that if you if you constrain the upload size then um for example even here so here you see um, this lower part of the slide this is a scheme where the length of the code is constrained to six so obviously this is not a capacity achieving scheme in that sense and so for this scheme the optimal code length turns out to be one which is bigger than seven over eight right whereas if it was a capacity scheme, then through that decoding tree converse, we proved that the code symbol had to be seven over eight. That's the smallest size it can have. But if you limit the code length to six, I mean, I mean for the optimal size, you would need a code of length eight. But suppose you link, limit the code length to six, then of course the code, the code size, optimal code size will be bigger than seven over eight. In this case, it's one. So what we want to do is say something like this more generally, that uh, if I have a code length constraint, then what is the best, meaning smallest, code symbol size that I need? And it will be bigger than what we have in the unconstrained case. Thank you very much. It was a very nice talk. Thank you. Okay. So I guess we're basically out of time. So why don't we end, end there? And let's all thank Syed again. Uh, thank you for your as <laughs> available. So th thanks very much for the really nice talk. Great. Thank you. So this concludes the session. All right, thanks, okay. Ed, and thanks everyone, thanks all the participants. So yeah, uh, go ahead, Daniel. Sorry, so that's uh, that, that's it for today. That's the last talk of today. So um, we're gonna resume tomorrow at, I believe, uh, 9 a.m. Uh, Boston time. Uh, see you all tomorrow. <laughs>